Today I'm here with Tiago Forte, creator of the Building a Second Brain course and uh, founder of Forte Labs. And we're going to be talking about building a second brain today. We're also going to be getting into his standard operating procedures system that he has in his business. Uh, called, some people call it SOPs. Uh, and there's going to be uh, some templates down in the description and a bonus related to that. So uh, we haven't figured out all the details yet, but that's going to be down in the description of this video. So we're going to start off talking a little bit about how we got together on this and then get into the SOPs. And then we'll be talking about the course itself, which is now in its 11th edition. So I want to start off, uh, Tiago, talking about how we got together on this because I had a student in one of my group coaching uh, groups and he came into one of the, uh, it was, this was just, I think two, three months ago. And he said he wanted to, he wanted my advice on how to integrate my functional areas taxonomy into para because he was currently going through uh, building a second brain must've been the last, the most recent cohort before this one. So uh, he was going through that. He wanted uh, my advice on that. And I really, I, I I tried to help him, but it was sort of a big thing. And so I sent an email to Tiago a day or two after, and I said, hey, I've got this student. Uh, I was thinking it'd be good to write some kind of article or something so that people will know how to integrate. So we've been going back and forth over the last uh, month or so, putting this thing together and uh, harmonizing our systems. And so then Tiago said, hey, I've got this launch coming up. And I said, yeah, uh, I'd love to be an affiliate on it. So that's a, a disclaimer to this whole video is I am an affiliate for building a second brain. So I do get paid when you enroll. There's a bonus that I'll be uh, announcing later and that'll be down in the description as well if you buy the course through my link. Uh, so I just wanted to say that. But uh, so we've been working back and forth on that. That's going to be published uh, probably by the time this video comes out. And so Tiago, I thought it'd be good to start off with uh, just how you got started with building a second brain uh, coming from getting things done. We're both students of David Allen's getting things done. And that's sort of the bedrock uh, foundational way of thinking about productivity that we both build on and personal knowledge management, accelerated learning, other stuff like that. So we both build off of that foundation for productivity. So Tiago, why don't you get started by just telling us sort of your story of uh, getting started with getting things done and then how you've built uh, building a second brain off of that. Yeah. So good to be here, Timothy. Thank you for, for putting this on. Thank you for hosting. Um, yeah, we have some similar background. We both teach online courses. We're both productivity junkies. Uh, it sounds like we both came up through GTD, which is getting things done, mm -hmm. which I think kind of like pioneered this idea that there is such a thing as personal productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, like that term kind of didn't exist before the early 2000s when the book came out. It was like, oh, no, productivity is for factories, for companies, for manufacturing. Mm -hmm. That has nothing to do with individuals. But um, I think what David Allen, who is the author of GTD, kind of pioneered is that, no, as an individual knowledge worker, you have, you're kind of like a factory in some ways. You have inputs and you have a series of steps that you go through to add value and to make those inputs more value, you know, more, more um, useful to people. And then you have outputs, which is your deliverables, your clients, your, you know, content that you produce, all that stuff. And so I think both of us have sort of been expanding, extending, you know, applying some of those principles and inventing new ones to more parts of, of people's productivity. Um, and I think a so, key part of your background is the consulting piece of it, where you were going into companies and you were, and you've even spoken with companies um, maybe you could talk about that a little bit about how, like, you know, your focus on productivity went through that avenue. Yeah, that, that's actually also the answer to your question about um, how this all started. Is my my first project when I started just to work for myself. I didn't even know I was going to be self-employed, but I just thought before I get my next job, this is back in 2013. Let me just try a couple projects and see if I can make any money with this whole online stuff. Right. And my first course was a GTD course. I just got the book and translated it directly into a video based self-paced course in 2013. And it was just a really lucky 
breakout success. I think it had more than between 15 and 20,000 people take that course. It was available on four or five different platforms. I eventually got on, I, it kind of blew up so much that I was on David Allen's podcast where he's interviewing me about my course based on his book. It was very, yeah, very everybody kind of, should check out that interview. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. That was a big moment. Um, but then it's, it's funny, the, the, the sequel, to the, the story with that is after the first year or so, when sales kind of started going down, I didn't think there was a future for me, a business for me with online courses, mm -hmm. right? Like that course was $29 and I, I thought, okay, for me to make this sustainable, I'd have to make a, a volume of courses like you do, right? <laughs> Which yeah. I, I knew that I could, I just wasn't capable of doing that. And so I pivoted to the corporate world. You know, corporate training is, is super profitable. You can, you know, companies are much less price sensitive than consumers. And so I would do workshops, talks, trainings, um, you know, corporate trainings basically for some of the top companies in the Bay Area, Genentech, Toyota, Nestle, um, these kind of companies. And it was, it was a good business, but it was so unsatisfying because I saw that it's like, I'm just making the most productive people in the world even more productive. Mm -hmm. I'm just making the most wealthy people, companies in the world even wealthier. <laughs> and it just was not satisfying. You know, my, my background was in nonprofits. All through my 20s, I, I taught English in South America. I volunteered in the Peace Corps in Ukraine. Like my heart is, is with the people in need, people who don't have access to high price consultants and corporate trainers. And so when I created Building a Second Brain, it was me returning to my roots, returning to, to, uh, to online courses, except this time I thought, you know, I looked at the biggest issue with self-paced courses, which is people tend to not finish them, right. right? I would hear constantly from the majority of my students that they couldn't find the time, couldn't find the discipline, couldn't make room for it. And so I thought, let me borrow what I had learned in corporate training about facilitation, about coaching, about that interaction and apply it to online courses, which created all that accountability for people to finish. And at the same time, it allowed me to, to charge more and actually make it a sustainable business. So that's how, that's how building a second brain started. And I actually, I was watching some video you were doing a few months ago about, about how having everybody on the webcam together in zoom or uh, having that interaction and getting that feedback when you first create the course, you're, you took that idea from when you were teaching English and getting all that feedback helped you continuously improve it. So I just did my first live course ever with my mental models course. And that was just a month ago. And I, I thought about that idea of, wow, you know, really getting that interaction at the beginning. And then the accountability is another piece I haven't even tried yet. But I think that's a, a really key component of this as well, because I mean, setting up, uh, if you really want to have good productivity and good personal knowledge management, you're, this is like one of the biggest investments in your life you're ever going to make. It's, it's even bigger than buying a car because once you're in that piece of software, once you've chosen that system, you really don't want to have to switch out of it later. So uh, that's, it, it, it's really important. And people are just starting to wake up to this idea that like even the money that you're spending on the course, it pales in comparison to the huge amount of time you're really deciding to invest. And I think having the live component, having the cohort, having the accountability, having the community, which you've got a great community going now, uh, Tiago gave me access to the course and there's a whole forum. There's a, uh, it's all really well put together. And so all of that is really useful for people putting in the time to actually implement this because it's not a small task. This is one of the biggest projects you're ever going to do in your life. Yeah, I love, I love that, Timothy. It's, it's, it's funny. We have a principle in, in our whole company that we don't say it's easy. We're, we do not use the word easy because it's not easy. You know, all these, these marketing campaigns, you see, oh, quick, easy three steps to lose weight or find a partner or, you know, like make more money. It's, it's nothing really transformative and, and meaningful and substantial is easy. You know, I, I describe it as a boot camp. It's like military training for your mind. Yeah. Um, getting back to the GTD idea, like 
I always think about that graphic he created, the sort of flow chart where it top to bottom. And there's that little icon of the filing cabinet. And PKM is really about, well, that little file cabinet is actually takes up like 95% of the whole system when you actually implement it. Like all your digital files, your hard drive, your filing cabinets, whatever, that's really 95% of it. And getting everything working in that, it's not like a little thing. It's actually a huge, huge, huge thing. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, your audience probably has had some, some really big breakthroughs around tasks, right? Yeah. Like usually if people are in their productivity, they've had some insight or breakthrough, maybe even they've, they've mastered their to-do list. Now imagine the impact that has on your productivity, your efficiency, your life satisfaction, your ability to sleep at night. And tasks, like you said, are like 1% of the information that you have in your life. Like think about really, you have to like really open your mind to how many different kinds there are. There's notes and there's files and documents and web clips and bookmarks and podcasts and eBooks and highlights and meeting notes. And it's like the probably list. In fact, I have a list of like a hundred different kinds of information. Yeah. What would be the impact of you mastering that flow of information? Yeah. So it's, it's really big and it's, people are just starting to wake up to this whole idea. So um, I want to, a, a thing that you've got in, uh, in your system and you just tweeted out it out a day or two ago. And I was thinking, you know, what would be a really cool thing for us to talk about and uh, do a little screen share. And, uh, and so you tweeted out this um, screenshots of all the SOPs in your notion and it's probably like four or five, six dozen of them at this point. So I thought, uh, so I sent you a WhatsApp. I said, hey, can you, uh, can you show us your SOP on how to create SOPs? It's like the perfect meta thing that I know my audience is going to like. So you're going to get that just for watching this video. That'll, it'll be in the description or something, how to get that. Uh, and there may be a few other things that we give out as well. But I wanted to get into that. And then we're going to come back and talk more about uh, building a second brain and uh, the launch that's coming up and just get more into the details of what it actually is. For those of you that aren't familiar with Tiago's para system, we'll get into that a uh, bit as well, because that's really the core uh, sort of root level organization of the whole thing. So uh, Tiago, why don't we get into that now, uh, get on the screen share. And then I'll, I first want to talk about the Evernote notion thing, because I think that's another sort of once you're getting to the more intermediate advanced level of productivity and personal knowledge management, you're thinking about, you know, maybe I want to use Evernote here, OneNote for this, or Rome Research for that, or Google Docs for that. And people end up, uh, we were talking about this on uh, the call a few days ago about how people want to use every different type of technology, every different type of app, every, you know, some people are on iPhone, some are on Android, some on Mac, some on PC, some on Linux. So people want to implement stuff on all these different platforms. And so I thought that would be interesting as well in terms of how you think about switching back and forth. Absolutely. So, yeah. So I think it'd be cool to start with that and then we'll get into the uh, SOPs and talk about that a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with SOPs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, no, the, the Evernote notion thing and then, oh. you know, zoom into the notion and then the SOPs in there. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. I'd love to share my screen so people can know what we're talking about. Um, this is my, Ever, my Evernote. This isn't a sample account, demo account. I always share with no, you know, cleaning up. It's like when someone visits your house, you know, you like clean your house so that they think you're actually, you know, a, a, a clean person. I don't do any of that. This is the real environment that I'm working in every single day. Uh, and for me, the, the really clear distinction is just Evernote is my personal knowledge base, my personal second brain, mm -hmm. and Notion is for the team. We have a team of, of 10 people that we work with to deliver all our courses. And so you see here, it's, it's highly informal. Mm -hmm. I'd say that's the defining difference. You know, For my personal system, I don't need headings, tables, strict templates. I don't need to be consistent. Almost every note is, is like this. It's kind of just a messy image thrown in with some email addresses, with some just comments, uh, quotes, 
uh, links just kind of all thrown together. And because I both created it and will be retrieving it, that's all I need. I have all the context just because it's me, right? So um, when you're doing your planning, like your weekly planning or whatever, how do you, is that integrated into Evernote at all? Or how does that work? So the thing I use for that is a little sticky note. Okay. Uh, and I just published a very comprehensive with demo videos and everything uh, guide to my weekly review, which yeah. you can find on my blog if you're interested. Yeah, I'll put a link to that. Um, in the, I, I remember reading that about it. It was about a month or two ago, but that yeah. is very good. So I recommend totally. it. Totally, totally. And, and even that, that's probably the most structured thing I do. You know, it's a five-part checklist that I do religiously one to tw once to twice a week. Even that is not that formal. Yeah. It's not that structured. It's just these five items. It takes me maybe 20 minutes. Okay, um, so you're, go you're in... Part of what I was thinking about is like, do you sort of block off your working in terms of a nine to five? And then during that nine to five, it's what am I going to do during the five days of the week, let's say. And then when you're not, like, how do you, how do you manage the planning of your personal life versus planning of your, like, does all your business stuff go into Google calendar? You know, yeah. how does that work? Definitely. I have some principles. Okay. Um, I wouldn't say I stick exactly to a nine to five, but I got married last year and we're expecting our first, our first child, a son in just about 10 weeks. Nice. And so I can feel the, the reality field around me slowly, like kind of forcing me to be more normal and to keep more yeah. normal hours, which is a good thing. Right. Yeah. Um, and so I do try to stick, it's probably more like eight to six or something. Okay. Um, and then in each day, I have a pretty consistent structure, which is morning is creative work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really the only time I can do kind of deep work, focused work, because my yeah. mind is just clear. I have high energy. And then all afternoon is calls with the team, with clients, with contractors, consultants. Um, and so each day kind of has a tick tock. The tick mm -hmm. is the morning creative work. And the, the talk is all my calls and meetings. Yeah. I, I, it's funny cause we never talked about this before, but I'm the same way. Like I don't ha schedule any calls in the morning and then that's when I do my deep reading, my deep work, just creative, whatever. So that's, that's interesting that that's how that just organically came uh, together like that. Yeah. I think, I think it makes a lot of sense for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. uh, and then for calendars, yeah, everything goes on the calendar. I, I, you know, one reason I got into all this stuff, the systems, task managers, calendars, digital notes, is that I have an awful memory. I have the worst memory. Like, I can't remember things from like five minutes ago. Right. So I don't even try. I don't even try anymore. I've outsourced my memory as much as possible to these, these software programs. So yeah, if it's, if it's not on the calendar, like I have my, my mom sends me calendar invites because if she's not on my calendar, it will just pass by and I won't even remember that we're supposed to have a phone call. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then I divide, let's see if I can show that. I divide it um, between red is work uh, and blue is personal. So okay, I, cool. I can kind of turn one off and just see work stuff or, or I can turn the other one off. Um, so let's see. Yeah. Evernote is, we can get more into, into how I use Evernote, but it's completely personal, which makes sense in, for a different reason, which is Evernote is not good for collaboration, right? Like if two people are looking, you can share a note, sure. But if two people try to edit it at the same time, it locks it, right? It's not like Google Docs that you can just go in there and both edit. It's, it's almost anti-collaboration, which for my personal stuff is fine, right? So it's interesting here how you do have like a lot of your personal projects here are business related projects. So how do you transfer those over? Yeah. So for me, this, I think you're referring to this right here, yeah. right? Yeah. So I'm extremely project centric. There's a whole unit in my course about my way of thinking of projects and why they're so important. Um, and so this is really, it's, it's like my dashboard of every open project that I'm working on at any given time. Okay. Uh, and it's also the primary way that I organize my knowledge. But, um, you know, Timothy, I, I think you have a more clear separation, but to me, there's no difference between personal and business projects. Yeah. I've never been to every project 
it's both business and personal. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I have them together. I, I have them completely mixed. Yeah. So, so all of those details, I mean, some of it you eventually need to transfer over to share with your team, right? So there, there's some handoff at some point where maybe the manuscript or maybe the, some outline you do of BSAB 11, like that gets sent to somebody on your team and then they do something with it. So then it would move over to Notion. Yeah. Okay. So you mean the transfer over to the team? Yeah. yeah that, that definitely is a, is a stark transition. Um, and for that, we use Notion. Yeah. Um, we have a shared workspace, which we call Forte Labs, which is our company, Forte Labs HQ. Mm -hmm. um, and the cool thing here is this is, I'm the least knowledgeable Notion user in our company. And I love it that way. I love it because I don't feel the responsibility to like, if something's wrong to fix it or to make it better. It's like my personal assistant, Bethany, mm -hmm. uh, she is the master of SOPs, which we're going to get into in a minute. This is every more than a hundred SOPs that we use to run our business. Wow. Um, and then we have pages sort of master pages for each of our main courses, which is building a second brain, rite of passage and the art of accomplishment. And these are man each one of these pages is managed by the course manager that runs that course. So these would be with your Paris system, these look more like they're functional areas, at least most of them rather than projects. Yes. Yeah. And that's that's something that took me a long time to to realize is that basically I think the right way to do group knowledge management is totally different from personal knowledge management. Hmm. Okay. I think they're, they're in many ways opposites. So like for, for building a second brand, we have people come in and say, Oh, I, I don't really care about my own notes, but I want to manage like my team. And I say building a second brain is about personal. I'm not even going to, I'm not going to promise anything beyond that. It is about your personal organization, your files, your notes. Hmm. Um, and actually you can use notion for that too. So you don't have to use the same Evernote and Notion split as I do. Many, many people use Notion um, as their personal knowledge management hub, but you just have to make that decision. So like in here, I see content. So would like a blog post be an example? Would you think of that as a, a, product, a project and then you keep them underneath content? Yeah. So I, for me, the blog started as a project. Right. Right. Most things do like, oh, let me just try this blogging thing. I don't know if it's going to work. Let me just try to publish 10 posts. Yeah. But then when a project is successful, usually you want to keep it going in some sense. Mm -hmm. And that's what I call an area of responsibility. So like this is actually a great example, too. This is our content workflow. This is like our content calendar. And it's, it's so funny because this started off as on my personal side. It started off in Evernote because it was just me. But then once I wanted my assistant to, to help me, right, to proofread, to set, set up posts in WordPress, to post something to Facebook, then I had to move all of that from Evernote to Notion. Uh, and so this is one of the pages that I use the most. Basically, each column is a stage of the publication process, hmm. right? So ideas is just like, oh, I should just write a post on X. It's just like random ideas. Then I start collecting notes, then they become outlines, then drafts, then these are all the completed posts. Then I send them to my newsletter, I send them to my paying uh, members, mm -hmm. post it on social media, and then the archive is everything that's done. Yeah, so that's actually a good little plug there for Praxis. That's your, uh, t I think it's, it's your uh, monthly paid newsletter where people get a fair amount of your stuff is in that. So that's another key thing that people should check out if they want to learn more about, because there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff in the course, but your most up-to-date thoughts, a lot of it and sort of cutting edge stuff goes through Praxis. Yes. Yeah. But you can think of it like Praxis is like, it's like the laboratory. It's like I'm writing and thinking and exploring every kind of aspect of productivity and beyond you can imagine. Mm -hmm. What goes in the course is like what I've figured out. Yeah. Right. Like th this is the right way. This is my recommendation at that stage is when it becomes something that I teach. So yeah, that is a good, they're, they're very highly related of course, but Praxis is much more exploratory and divergent. Yeah. Whereas the course is more like how to. So with these SOPs, would you consider them a resource? 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So let's let's take a look at the SOPs now because I think that's a and I and let's talk about how you tag them also because I thought that was a really creative thing. Yeah, I mean, it was Bethany that came up with it, not me. <laughs> so I want to say a few things about about how we work together, me and Bethany. I think personal assistants are an absolutely game changing milestone in your professional life. Yep. Um, I cannot say enough about it. It's like I hired Bethany maybe about eight months ago. And when I hired her, part of the on, I used a, an, a personal assistant matchmaking service called Great Assistant, which I highly recommend. Mm -hmm. And they forced me to do homework because they, they needed me to do certain things before hiring them. And one of them was list 10 tasks that you can delegate. Yeah. And you're not allowed to move forward. And I had trouble coming up with 10. I was like, I had to really think, oh, no, I need to do that. I need to do that. I need to do it. Like I had trouble coming up with 10. And now eight months later, there's over 100 things that Bethany does instead of me. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say just ballpark, I probably spent at least 80% less time on administrative tasks, which I hate. Probably 60 to 70% less time on email. All the all the, the customer service emails. So when someone just emails me through my website, go to Bethany. Like I don't even see those. My, my email volume is probably 70% less. Wow. Um, and then even creative work, I can do faster because the 20% of it that can be done by someone else is, is what she does. So it's a big game changer, but here's the thing. You can't hire a personal assistant to fix you, right? Yeah. They won't come in and help like help you figure stuff out and get you organized in fact they will just magnify what you're already doing so if you have a good task manager they will have a good task manager if you define your projects they will have clear projects goals goals they, they're just a magnification of you yeah. so what i found is creating this list you see in front of you was only possible because i had already started the process of, of externalizing my thoughts hmm. right i i already had evernote notes they might have been messy but i could I could share them with Bethany and say, here's how I do this. And then she would go through and organize it, structure it, and make it into an SOP. So that, that's sort of my word of warning is, is you, you have to figure it, personal knowledge management out for yourself to a certain level before you, you can actually get help. Yeah. Um, it, yeah. And it's almost kind of like learning how to program is you're, you have to think about what are the instructions, what are the steps, and what are all the little details that are tacit to you you really need to bring the, you need to surface all that and, um, and turn it into a, an SOP. So exactly, exactly. You have to change the way you think. Yeah. Um, so I had Bethany just before this call, send me three of the SOPs she uses the most. Um, so this, this is what, this is what you see when you just click any of any of these items. This is just uh, looking at it in the web view. Okay. Um, and you can see we actually keep it really simple. Most of the fields are empty. You know, there's who it was created by, who is the owner, when it was created, when it was updated. But besides that, it's just a, it's a checklist. Yeah, right? I want to give people a little context if they haven't used Notion. Uh, the way it's, the reason why there's all these fields at the top is because it's basically treats, at least this is my understanding of it, it treats the content, which is these uh, lines of text, log into memberful, et cetera. It treats that as actually just a single cell in a row of a spreadsheet. And then the, these other things like created, last updated, created by owner, those are other columns in the spreadsheet. And so you set that up and, and the way it's displaying it is vertical, but it's really, my understanding is the way they store the information is as a row in a spreadsheet. And so that's part of what makes Notion so powerful is that it's sort of got a, a different architecture underneath that allows you to do some really cool things. Totally. That's it. Yeah. You can see this. You can see the same data in different ways. You can see it in a table view in a Kanban board view in a document view in a calendar view without changing the data. The data stays the same. You don't copy paste. You don't duplicate. You just change the view. Yeah, and I think that it also makes it more scalable where if you have a company and it's going to continue to be growing and more people working together on stuff, 
that's where you can run into some of these issues with OneNote or Evernote where stuff that'll work when it's just you isn't, it's going to be a little bit more tough once you get more and more people involved. Exactly. Yeah, I, I would even go further and say the very same things that make, you know, personal notes apps powerful, make them flawed when it comes to your team. Hmm. Like right? what's it's an like, example or how do you, is there any, can you detail that out a little bit? Yeah, so, so like with Evernote, the fact that, that it's free form, you know, you just, you create a new Evernote note and you just have a blank, a blank canvas. This works great for you personally, right? You just start writing. Whereas in, whereas in Notion, you have fields, right? Which are essential because it tells you what that data is, yeah. right? Think if you didn't have these labels on the left, you know, these are tags, this is the video, this is the property, this is what it's related to. If you just had this column, some new employee or some colleague would be like, they'd have to come and ask you, what, what is this, what is this? Like, you'd have to explain all the stuff. Yeah. So I, I think there's a general principle of the more people involved, the more structure there has to be. Yeah. But the fewer people involved, the less structure you want. Yeah. Um, is this a... This has bullet points in it as opposed to the, um, we'll look, yeah, we're looking at Notion. This one has both, is there a reason why like you use bullet points as opposed to um, the, the arrows? Yeah, so, so it's a perfect example of what, what, I, what I was just saying is, Bethany and I have realized SOPs have to be as absolutely simple as possible. Mm -hmm. So she starts with bullet points. When an SOP is just beginning, it's like point, a, B, and C. She only adds toggles, which is what Notion calls those, when there's too many points. Right? Okay. So like if you expanded this out, if these, this was all one flat list, right, without any differentiation, it'd be quite challenging. But this way she can just say, okay, I logged into Memberful, I can close that. I know the types of membership plans, I can leave that closed. I can confirm membership. It gives her a way to stage the task into discrete chunks. Okay. All right. So do we, this is the, let, let's take a look at, is there anything else you want to say about this one? I think, um, I mean, it makes sense what you got here. I like it. Yeah. Um, let's see what these other, these other um, SOPs have. So I guess this one has a couple extra things. There's an image, yep. right? Sometimes words don't convey things very well. You just need an image. And that's, that's what she has here. But then also there's links. Okay. So this is where having a shared team, a centralized knowledge base for your team is so powerful is you never have to duplicate. Right? So for this SOP, create an automation in ConvertKit. ConvertKit is the email marketing platform that we use. As she's going along and doing the task, if she gets to the point where it's time to create a template. There's no reason to re-explain how to make a template. You just link to it, mm -hmm. right? And it's funny, this one also links back to the automation. So what starts to happen is you can compose SOPs out of smaller SOPs, right? Every task is made up of smaller tasks. Mm -hmm. If you have all the smaller tasks, just link them together into sort of like a super SOP. Right, yeah, okay, cool. Um, and then this one, yeah, so this is interesting. Becca is my, my business partner's personal assistant. Okay. And what's so cool, so, so my business partner's name is David. He went through the process I just described, yep. right? Hired an assistant, created SOPs. But what's cool now is our assistants collaborate. Wow. So how does that so work? Like, it's, it's so cool. They, they actually have meetings all through the week because Basically, what happens is if Bethany says, oh, how do I edit a video? If mm -hmm. I know that Becca knows that, I can just either say, Bethany, just ask Becca. Or even better, I can say, just look at Becca's SOP. They share SOPs, huh. right? Because Good. my my business partners and my business overlap to the extent that we share the same processes, we can pass SOPs back and forth. So that's what happened here. Becca has a background in video editing, whereas Bethany does not. Yep. So they sat down on the call, Becca explained her process, and Bethany, you know, 
documented the entire process of editing a video. And now my assistant has a capability that I never had to teach her. So what percentage would you say of these SOPs did you create versus your assistant or someone else created? Yeah, I didn't really. So the way that we create them, and this might relate to what you had mentioned before, yeah. which is an SOP on how to create SOPs. Yeah. So here's what I realized is I can't actually fully create the SOP myself because it's like implicit knowledge. Yeah. Right. It's, it's when it's something is so natural and intuitive for me, it, for anyone, any of us, it's actually really hard to explain what you're doing. Okay. Yeah. So our process is for creating SOPs is we get on a zoom call. We do this once a week. And I just look at my to-do list for the past week and I look at something that I want to offload to her. Mm -hmm. I look at something that some task that I did in the past week that I want to document and I just walk through it. I just talk, okay, now I'm doing this. I don't want to do that. Here's what I'm trying to achieve. Here's what I, what I clicked on. Here's why. And she just asked me questions. She says, Oh, why did you click, you know, that video resolution instead of this resolution? Oh, it's because YouTube only allows up to this and there's a whole explanation right? That I would have never thought to document that she puts down into the SOP. So actually we're collaborating on almost every single on a, almost every single one of these. Yeah. I think that's a really interesting piece to it where instead of having people do it on their own, you can be there to make sure they don't forget to include, and you've got it recorded on a zoom call. So, so how, like, what do you do with that recording? Where does that, how do you store that? And then how do you link that? Do you link it back to the SOP that it's related to? Not explicitly, but there is this step here. Um, we, we found over time that even kind of going through it step by step and her asking questions, we would miss things, mm -hmm. right? So what she'll do, we, we record every Zoom call. She rewatches it in its entirety wow. and then sends me afterwards the first draft of the SOP plus her questions. And that allows me to make adjustments. I can say, oh, no, I said this, but it's actually like this. Or in this situation, I did this, but most of the time, I actually want to do this other thing. It's like the mm -hmm. SOP becomes a back and forth loop. Yeah. Um, and only when I give the final approval and I say, this is now correct, does it get added to our database. Hmm. Okay. So is there anything else you do in terms of organizing your SOPs we haven't covered? Or is this a pretty much it? That's pretty much it. It's kind of simple, isn't it? Like, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, we we slowly add more detail and structure over time, but we we really have a belief in, in in our company in our culture that more structure is not necessarily better mm -hmm. because when you add structure, now you have to maintain that structure. You have right. to train other people on how to use that structure. You have to change the structure when it gets outdated. So I really believe in informality. I think keep things as, as loose and as informal as you can possibly get away with is my philosophy. Yeah, that's actually an interesting area where I think we differ slightly or we're a little bit different on the spectrum. I think you're, I mean, I, I did my natural planning course, like my natural rhythm planning course where I talk about how I really do a lot, even though my planning system that I teach is quite regimented and I'll have like, a surgeon using it and their day is literally packed to the gills and they have one hour free time a day. But what I'm doing with it is I'm trying to optimize for creativity. So that morning of, of deep work, Cal Newport, where I just want to, I don't even know what I'm going to do. I, I wake up and, and I'm thinking, what do I feel like reading? What do I feel like working on? So I do try to keep that openness at the same time. I find that having taxonomies for certain things, like all my learning projects, I've got over 2000 learning projects. I like having that organization for that. And uh, like in my mental models course, I talk about, uh, and I've got another course on it, the Library of Congress classification system. So if you try to use uh, the, the classification PDFs, if you download them, it's over 10, possibly over 20,000 pages of subcategories down to like 10 levels of, of depth. So it's impossible unless you're a professional librarian and even then you're never going to use most of it and it's a tremendous amount of work that the u.s government puts into uh into updating it and maintaining it and improving it so there's a tremendous amount of work involved in thinking about what taxonomy you're going to use and and if you're going to use one and it can become a burden onto itself so 
the way I think about it is you have to be really careful about balancing and not putting more structure on yourself than you really need. And not just because somebody else uses this much structure, you use it also. So I think you do have to be very careful about not locking yourself in by having too rigid of a structure. And, uh, and so I think, I think we're actually more in agreement than we, than we, it may seem on the surface, but I, if you're thinking about what's one of the things that differentiates us, it's, I get more into that classification taxonomizing stuff, even though I would say the majority of my students don't actually use it or use very little of it. So mm -hmm. it's more of a thing if there's a certain area of your life where that kind of additional structure is really going to help you then go for it, but don't think that, oh, I need to have the same level of com complexity in all areas of my life. It can be nice to have it in one or two areas where it's really useful and then not have it anywhere else. Like I, I've got a coaching client. He wanted, I, I was like, hey, you should really start getting to the gym more and, and exercising more. It's going to help with your thinking and stuff. He wanted to put everything into a spreadsheet. And I said, you know, there's certain areas of your life where it doesn't need to be in a spreadsheet. It doesn't need to be over-engineered. And so I think finding that balance of, of when should it be over-engineered or under-engineered or, or just, it's really about finding the right fit for each area of your life. Totally. That right balance. Totally. Yeah, you pointed to some, to some great insights there, which is usually people have a certain level of organization that they stick to across their entire life. It's sort of like a fixed point. Yep. But actually, like you, you pointed out, there's some areas of your life that you need to be, you benefit from being more structured. Yep. So it's good to have that as an option, as, as a capability that you can, you can deploy. But yep. then there's other parts that need less structure, even um, seasons. There's seasons of your life where you want to revel in the uncertainty and the chaos, and it's nice to be able to do that. Mm. And then other times you need to, you know, if you have a health condition, you know, that you need to manage medications and surgeries. You don't really want to be loose and chaotic and you want to be more controlled. But if you're, you know, I don't know, playing with your kids, you don't really want to do that on a spreadsheet. Like yeah. it, it's really about having the maximum range mm -hmm. rather than picking one kind of fixed point on the spectrum. Yeah. And I thought your wife Lauren's article on feminine productivity had some really interesting, I think that came out within the last month. There's a lot of really interesting stuff in there. So I suggest people check that out also if they're interested in sort of the balancing kind of stuff. Um, but I think it'd be good to get into uh, building a second brain now and start with talking about para and then just sort of the story of, I think you told a bit of the story of how it came into being, but uh, maybe flesh that out a little bit more. And then I really want to get into like how it's improved over this, these last 10 cohorts. Cause I think it's, it's really critical, you know, how much it's just improved time after time. And there's all these alumni now. So there's a lot of stuff there. And, and why don't you just, you know, sort of take it away? Yeah. Yeah. It's really my, it's really my focus, our flagship product. It's my kind of my life's, my life's work so far. Um, we've been teaching this course for a little over three and a half years now. Uh, like you said, there's been 10 cohorts. The first cohort was, was 30 people. Um, the most recent one was over 800. Mm -hmm. So it's grown tremendously in size. And as part of that, we've had to, and, and been excited to create new, new, new ways of learning that don't rely on me as directly. So what we have, because the cohort is so large now, we have alumni mentors, which I kind of mentioned before. We have people train in various specialties. They each lead little breakout sessions, kind of like at a conference. You know, you listen to the keynote speaker, they kind of give a cool speech, but then to actually get into the, into the nuts and bolts, you go to your breakout session. Um, we have uh, guest lectures and, and guest workshops. We have the online forum, like you said, which has a few hundred different active threads on every, trust me, every aspect of personal knowledge management you can imagine. Um, so really I'm, I'm leading a team. We have a team of like, close to 30 people if you count the alumni mentors that is leading this this cohort um what we found over time is we would learn so much from every cohort you know they would give us tons of feedback this could be different that could be different i want more information on this less information on this that we started thinking of each cohort as a version kind of like a software program right 
like Evernote or Notion or Rome comes out with version three, version four, version five, you wake up in the morning and you just have access. It's update, you know, software update. You have this whole new kind of program with new features. That's how the course is. Every single student has lifetime access to future versions of the course. Right. And we do that on purpose because over time, like building a second brain, you know, it's not a one time. Oh, I did one thing and it's done. It's kind of a lifelong process. Yeah. It's a lifelong process of evolving and learning and iterating on how you manage your information. And so I want people to come back. We have many, many students who've done the course more than once, or sometimes they do the course and then they subscribe to the blog. So they kind of have a continuous flow of things. Um, but really, I, I see it as an, as, a, as an ongoing community of incredibly smart and interesting and talented people. And the course is sort of the gateway. It's the front door to that, that community. I saw one of the things in the course. I was looking through the first few sections, and you had a, uh, like a pie chart of all the different um, professions people come from and industries. Maybe you could talk about like what the top five are and just like, but it was amazing what a diversity there was of people. Oh, it's, it's stunning. We've had from high schoolers to 90 year olds. Um, I'd say if I had to say the, the most common kinds of people or professions, it's, it's strongly people who are in information intensive professions who just by the nature of the work have to consume organize, make sense of, and then deploy a lot of information, very complex information, information from many sources. I'd say that's the first big commonality. It's people who are drowning, people who are just can barely keep their head above water when it comes to the information that they, that they are taking on. Uh, and then I'd say the second thing is people in innovative industries. You know, if you, if your industry doesn't change or changes very slowly, then you just sort of, you just kind of manage change just in whatever way you can. But when you're in a company or a role or an industry or in a market that is really uh, innovating quickly, that is what creates the necessity to be exposed to many kinds of information, right? It's like when a, when a situation is evolving quickly, you have to maintain situational awareness. You can't afford to put the blinders on, you know, put your heads down, your head down, only focus on your current task. You have to maintain the sort of full spectrum awareness. What is happening with this competitor? What is happening with that technology? Even what is happening in other industries, right? Like you have to pay attention to so many things and your, your biological brain is not designed for that. It was not designed to pay attention continuously to many, many things. But that's yeah, what a so second brain is good at. People can get away with not having all this stuff externalized in a second brain if they're just doing the same stuff every day. But people are not even having regular careers anymore. They're going to switch five or ten times and be doing different things. So it's tremendously valuable to have this kind of stuff. Uh, let's talk about para a little bit, because I think that's a key thing to, and part of what I like so much about it is it's very action oriented. And when people ask like, oh, well, there's theoretically 20 different ways you could organize this. I always come back to, okay, well, what's the most useful? So what are you going to actually use? What's the, what's going to make it most likely that you get that deliverable done, you take that next step. So that's part of what I like about the sort of four different, um, parts of the Kanban, or that's one way to think about it, but the four different, maybe you could talk about that para, because that's sort of the, the fundamental of everything. Yeah. You know how this started is I worked at the Apple store in, uh, in Fashion Valley, San Diego, uh, which at the time was one of the top, it was in the top five busiest Apple stores in the world. Mm -hmm. And I would do these, they were called like personal training sessions. You could, you could pay, come in and you would work with me. And we had other people in the store one-on-one -on -one to learn your computer. And the reason I came up with Para is I'd have one hour, like one hour to have an impact on this person who paid money, who just bought a thousand, multi-thousand dollar computer yep. so that they could, they could be productive. They could do their creative projects. And at first I would try to organize everything perfectly. And after one hour, we'd get like 2% done and they'd be like, okay, so what's my, you know, what do I get out of this? And I'd be like, well, just come, come back for 50 more sessions. Yeah. 
And so I just started to think, oh my gosh, how can I in one hour or less, ideally, because we want to get, get on to actually doing the work, how can I get them organized? Yeah. And I just came down to four, like from experience, four buckets is the most that someone can hold in their mind. It's like, it's the, the and actually I've come across some academic papers in, in biology and anthropology. It's actually called the magic number four, huh. because when you glance at four items, that's the, that's the highest note, like biologically in your brain, that's the highest number that you can count without having to count. Yeah. I, I was just talking to my dad about something kind of related to this. There's some mathematical thing where it's impossible to space five points on a sphere equally distant from each other. And, the, and so there's something about like space and time or, or the three dimensional plane or something where it's just, I don't know if anybody knows anything more about that. So leave a comment or something, but uh, yeah, I do. I use a, a, a four piece model also a professional life, personal life relationships and health. And I call it the big four. So I do agree that like, it's nice to have quadrants. It's nice. It, it, it makes it, you know, Eisenhower matrix. It makes it easy to just sort of split stuff up and it has a nice symmetry to it. Yeah. And I've noticed people try to create a fifth category all the time they go, oh, I need, a, I need a new one for habits, for systems, for goals. Right. Almost every time, a few months later, it's, they come back and it's broken down. Five is yeah. it's hilarious. Four is enough, five is too many. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, para, so it's projects, uh, areas, which I call functional areas, but it's the same thing. Pro, uh, projects, areas, resources, and then archives. So why don't you just give like a quick definition of each of those? Sure. <clears throat> it's, it's really very straightforward. Projects are any goal that you're working toward that has a beginning and an end. Areas are ongoing responsibilities that continue indefinitely. Resources are just useful things that don't fit in the previous two categories. Um, you know, knowledge, uh, checklists, research, web pages, anything that could potentially be useful. Like your book, your all that stuff. Yes, you can think of it like your your personal encyclopedia, your knowledge library, your uh, repository of interesting research. Any any of those, um, and then archives is simply anything from the previous three categories that is no longer active. So yeah, you know, with, with digital information, there's really no reason to ever delete anything. Yep. Right. As long as here's the caveat: as long as you can hide it. Yep. completely out of sight where it's never going to clutter your workspace, then you should keep it. So that's the archive. Yeah. It's sort of like you put stuff in your attic, your basement storage unit. It's sort of the equivalent of that, but informationally. And this is the subject that I wrote this article on and that we worked back and forth on of how I integrate the taxonomy and the learning project stuff. So that'll be down in the description if you want to learn more about that. Uh, so let's talk, is there anything else that's sort of, changed as the cohorts have gone by or anything else that's different about this uh version 11 and uh and and then uh what are the next steps people can take and and what's 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 this whole launch that's coming up yeah so for each cohort we do it we do it its own launch where we talk about what's new what's different what's changed mm -hmm. um each launch has a theme uh which is a film so this this time around it's inception so okay. like the architect, uh, I think her name was Ariadne in the movie Inception. She was creating these worlds that people could inhabit. And that's kind of what we do with your second brain is create like a, an information environment, an information architecture. Um, and I'd say, so, so I guess a couple of details first. Um, we have an enrollment window because this isn't a self-paced course. It's not just like and anyone come in as many people as you want like you're assigned to a group you have an alumni mentor you have to you know sign up for certain sessions so that's why we have a distinct enrollment window which this time goes from august 17th to august 24th so that's that's the only time that enrollment is actually open and then the course actually kicks off august 31st and goes for five weeks until september 30th um, so those are the details. Uh, if you just go to buildingasecondbrain.com, there's a form right there at the top of the page. If you submit your email address there, you're going to get all the details, all the dates, all the information you need. Mm -hmm. um, but basically, so if I had to point, we're actually completely redesigning the curriculum. We don't have time to get into that, but 
I have a wall over here with every little element of the course on a sticky note. And there's probably a hundred sticky notes that were completely reshaping and moving things around based on three years of feedback. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to flow easier. It's going to be simpler. It's going to correspond to how people actually learn. We're going to kind of rearrange a lot of stuff, but I'd say Timothy, the biggest difference is when I started this course, Evernote was the almost the only way to do personal knowledge management, you know, in, in 2016. Um, but like you were saying, this idea is going mainstream in a huge way. Like personal knowledge management, three years ago, I didn't know anyone else that even knew that term. Yeah, now academic. you hear it, it, like in the New York Times, on m big podcasts, it's, it's crazy. The second brain is like, you know, and, and I'm only a small part of that. I think that idea has been around for a long time. But um, through our, our surveying our audience, three apps have emerged mm -hmm. as far and away the strongest contenders, which are continue to be Evernote and then Notion and Roam. Um, there's probably about a quarter of the whole student body that uses each of those apps. And then the last quarter is like 30 or 40 different other apps. I, by the way, just very quickly, how do you use, do you use Roam right now? For anything? I'm just getting into it. I'm starting to, yeah. to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So those, uh, that's one of the other sort of uh, side things about me is that I use uh, OneNote. I'm I'm not wedded to OneNote, but I do. I'm so like we were talking about earlier. Once you get into a certain app and you have all your stuff built into that, there is a certain amount of vendor lock-in. So, uh, but it is quite possible using uh, Para or the these concepts that can be used within any app to go between apps and use the same architecture along those different apps and then just link in between them. So it's not like, so Rome has certain uh, features of interlinking things back and forth where in certain, you know, for certain projects, it can just be a game changer versus anything else. So that's an example of how these architectures can be really valuable um, for sort of hopping from app to app for different things. Uh, so, and then if you're watching this video and uh, it's 2021 or some, I think you said you're running these twice a year right now, but people can get on a wait list and, um, and whatever, uh, if you want to check in with me uh, about whatever bonus that I'm offering at the time, if you're watching this months or years later, uh, you can just send me an email and there may be stuff down in the description, but I will be doing some kind of uh, significant bonus if you buy it through my link. So. Uh, you just, uh, there'll be details down in the description of this video if you want to pursue that and want more information about that. So I think that really covers everything. Is there any final, um, actually, no, I wanted to ask you, can you think of like some uh, example of a recent student who's just sort of told you a story? I think that all, that kind of bring it together for people of like, what is life going to be like five weeks from now or eight weeks from now once they've gone through this cohort? Yeah, great question. Um, yeah, there's actually a testimonial video that we're going to be publishing soon. It's from uh, Dr. Michelle Gill, who just said some really incredible things. Basically, she's a she's a professor. She's an educational psychologist at some university, and she just talked about how, you know there's this real, it's like you can have an understanding of psychology and a really good understanding of psychology, but there's a, a certain level of practicality that is not a, it is not academic. It's not theoretical. It's not really necessarily based on research. It's based on just someone having figured it out through trial and error and testing and experimenting and just finding what works. And I kind of feel like that's what I, what I offer the most, you know, I don't have the strongest theoretical understanding of this. There's books out there and courses you can take that are much more powerful, but there's no other course I know of it. But like we, I share my screen and I show you how to use the web clipper. How do you actually write a task? How do you insert an image? Like the most mundane practical things while also keeping in mind the concepts. Yeah. Um, I'd love to put a link to her test. It's like a two or three minute testimonial video where she just yeah, talks about her experience that. that I think speaks much more eloquently than I can. <laughs> yeah. 
And it's funny that the whole academic side of it, both of us have done reading on the academic side of things in PKM, and it is somewhat of an established academic field, but it really hasn't produced much of anything in terms of practical systems or, or to the extent that it has, none of them have gone anywhere. So it, it has been interesting to me how they're really, the both of us are doing stuff within that realm and making it more practical. But part of why I point people to your course is because my courses on this stuff don't have nearly, they don't have the support, they don't have the community, they're not the live thing, they're these self-paced things. And they don't get into all the details. I mean, I don't have anything where I'm sharing my screen or I'm telling you how to do specific things. And so I, I agree with you. There's nothing even close to your course in terms of if you want to actually just get this part of your life taken care of and two months later have something real that works, there's nothing out there like it. So uh, I put my full endorsement on it and I think people should check it out. There's a refund if you want to try it out and doesn't work out for whatever reason, no harm, no foul. So um, I'm always very strong on refunds for my own stuff and Tiago as well. So um, I stand behind that guarantee as well. So uh, I encourage you to try it out. I'm actually going through the course right now as well. So I don't know if I'll be in all the live sessions, but I'll be going through and, and uh, deepening my knowledge on everything. And I'm excited to see how it continues to grow. So uh, there'll be links down below for everybody to uh, check things out. I'll have that testimonial of information on the bonuses and uh, a link to the course pa page where you can watch the video and read up more about it, get all the details. And uh, you, your team, people can reach out to you and ask you questions. So Absolutely. if they have any questions, you know, there's somebody you can actually talk to. You can hop on a call and ask questions and uh, and you know, get all the information you want. So, and yeah, any final you, words, Tiago? Yeah, please, please just talk to us. We're, we're not some faceless corporation. You know, my, the course manager, Will Mannon, is the friendliest human being on the planet. Yep. And he loves answering student emails. We're going to do Zoom Q&As where you can just ask, like, there's really, there's no secrets. We'll tell, tell you what's going on behind the scenes. We'll tell you our thinking process. We'll do a live Q&A. We'll do a bunch of free events that you can come. Uh, too, and just and just get a taste of what is the kind of stuff we teach. Uh, let's see. You can get on on Twitter and social media. We have a very active building a second brain Facebook group that's completely free that you can get in there and talk to graduates. Ask them. I love love when people. It's a little bit of an audio lag. Uh, just I don't know if you can hear me, but it just uh, froze. Okay, it, it's back now. Can you just repeat? You were saying it just cut out for maybe 15, 20 seconds. Yeah, okay, let me try that again. Yeah, I just really encourage people to reach out to us. You know, yeah. our, our course manager, Will, is the friendliest human being you'll ever meet. Um, he'll answer every email or sometimes I'll answer it in my emails that go out. We're going to have a live Q&A where you can show up on Zoom and just actually ask any question you have. We have a very active free Facebook group called the Building a Second Brain official group. Um, that you can join and, and check things out, talk to graduates, see what kind of results they had. Basically, I just encourage you to, to, to find out if this is a good fit for you and if it is, to, to join us in, in August. Yeah, and I recommend people check out Tiago's Twitter also because I, I think you're the most, uh, you're the biggest uh, Twitter in the PKM space by far. And I, I <laughs> love just seeing all your, your tweets come in a couple times a day and there's always good stuff there and good conversations uh, too underneath. So, uh, yeah, Tiago, thanks again for coming on, and I encourage you all to check out the course and uh, give it a try. So, Tiago, Thank thanks. You. and Thank uh, you so much, Timothy. Really appreciate it. Good to have you here.